We had an amazing day at the Irish Writers, Writers Weekend yesterday. The sessions were all phenomenal, and I hope you'll find the same today. Obviously, we're starting uh, with the first session today with uh, Susanna Dickey, Megan Nolan, uh, and then the day runs on, so pretty scrutinise the programme. Just a reminder that we have two sessions later in the main building rather than here, uh, so you'll have an option on which to go to. We have a wonderful poetry session at... Um, 11.15, no, 11.30, and, no, beg your pardon, 1.30, 1.30, I don't even know my own program. 1.30 is the poetry, and then 3.15 is a tribute to the uh, late Niall McDevitt. But obviously sessions all the way through here, concluding at the end of the day with the film screening. So um, both the festival is... Uh, very delighted to have the support of Culture Ireland, the Embassy of Ireland in London, and incredibly the support of the Doyle Collection Hotel, who've, who've housed all our wonderful writers this weekend and made them extremely happy indeed uh, with their surroundings. So that's one thing off my, off my plate. But today's session is, um, has been done writing other selves. It's Susanna Dickey, it's Megan Nolan, and our chair is Sasha de Boul, who is uh, the former director of Culture International uh, Festival of Literature and a writer in her own right. So please welcome to the stage our panel. <laughs> Hello everyone, and uh, thank you for the whoops. Really appreciate that level of enthusiasm on a Sunday morning. I think that's entirely fair enough. Um, <clears throat> as John was saying, welcome to the British Library for this brilliant weekend of Irish writing. This is our second day uh, of our first ever edition, but long may it continue. Yeah. Uh, if anything, you know, just for the excuse to bring a bunch of Irish writers to London and have a really fun time. <laughs> um, I'm Sasha de Boyle and I am really thrilled today to be joined by two of, I would say, Ireland's most exciting new voices in fiction and other areas, <laughs> Megan Nolan and Susanna Dickey. Um, a little bit about the format of our event today. Uh, we'll kick off with some readings, and then uh, Susanna and Megan and I will have a chat, and then there'll be time for questions from the audience as well. Um, so I'll probably start off with a bit of an introduction, but you know, once more with feeling, a big boule bus, and a, <laughs> a welcome to Susanna Dickey and Megan Nolan. Um, I have said boule bus about five times since I've gotten here. I can't help it. I feel like because it's an Irish Writers Weekend, uh, that means a round of applause in Irish for any non-Irish speakers. Uh, I just can't stop saying it. It's like I'm a, child's, a children's TV presenter. <laughs> well done, well done. Um, so Megan Nolan is a writer of essays, reviews and fiction. Her work has been published in the New York Times, The Right Review, The Sunday Times and The Guardian. Uh, do you currently write a fortnightly column for the New Statesman? No. I do not believe so. <laughs> that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> but your debut novel, Acts of Desperation, came out in 2021 and your second book, Ordinary Human Failings, is out next year. Yeah. Uh, would you like to start us off with a wee read? Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I'm Maybe just going to let us know a bit about the book as well, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so. Act of Desperation is my debut novel, and uh, it's a, told from the point of view of an unnamed narrator who's a young woman in her 20s in Dublin, um, and she kind of begins this obsessive love affair with a man called Kieran, who uh, becomes the point of her life and uh, focus for all of the ways that she's, you know, lacking direction and a purpose, and he kind of becomes the the central uh, meaning of her life. And this this part is just after he's uh, left her. For, uh, for one of many times. Uh, so, yeah, I'll just read it. It's maybe like three or four minutes long. Uh, the loss of someone you love can make you go mad in the best of circumstances. But I did not just love Kieran, but loved him darkly, wrongly. Losing someone you love in those ways can turn you not only mad, but wicked too. When he left me, I dreamed of the two of them sometimes, woke up sweating. I thought of going to his house and hammering on the window until they let me in. I dreamed that march of killing her and woke oddly calm, thinking repetitively, well, stranger things have happened. Well, stranger things have happened. I'd slipped into his room as they slept and stood looking at them from the doorway. Moonlight was on their faces and made them look beautiful, already dead. I wrapped her beautiful dark hair around my fist and cracked her skull against the wall. One, two. And because it was a dream, I was strong enough to move her entire body in a violent wave with one hand. 
Her mouth was open and dribbling and bubbling and there was a black stain on the headboard behind and her long, thin arm was twitching and grasping uselessly until it wasn't. Beside her, Kieran watched calmly, his eyes raising to meet mine once she had stopped breathing. And then he turned back towards the wall in the same position he always slept, dragging the blanket tight around him. At night, sometimes I called Lisa, the only person I could say the truth to, the truth that was so basic and so large. I need him, I need him, I sobbed to her. I can't do it, I'm not able to do it, meaning to live, to go on living without him. And I loved her for not bothering to contradict me or to tell me that I didn't need anybody, that I would get over it. She knew intuitively, knew always, that she herself did not need anybody else to live. But this difference between the two of us didn't make my experience any less real than her own. She had seen how actual the need was with her own eyes. When once I gasped, I'm alone, I'm so alone, I'm scared, she didn't pretend that I wasn't. I know you are, she agreed. You are. I looked for other people who had felt like me, hoping for comfort or clues. My Google search terms were things like obsessive love, famous cases of unrequited love, incidents of obsession. I read about a story I had heard first on a podcast years before about a man named Carl Tanzler, a medical professional, though not a doctor, in Florida, he had fallen in love with his patient, a Cuban-American woman named Maria Elena Milagro in the 1920s. She had suffered from tuberculosis, which had also killed one of her sisters. Tanzler was instantly obsessed with her, offering her, her his, his dubious medical expertise and radiology equipment, going to her family home to administer additional treatments. He showered her with gifts and jewelry, declared her the love of his life. The realization of a series of visions he had seen of a mysterious dark-haired angel she offered no reciprocation. Her family undoubtedly must have found him an oppressive and disturbing presence, but, al but allowed his advances as long as they held some potential to cure her. But it all came to nothing, and she died in 1931. Tanzler paid for the funeral and constructed a mausoleum. In 1933, he visited the site of her burial at night and used a cart to remove her decomposing corpse, putting it in his car and taking it home. There he used pins and wires and a ham-fisted, cage-like construction to keep her disintegrating bones together and wrapped them with gauze and muslins heavily coated in fragrance to try to drown out the persistent smell of her decay. He made a mask, blank and smooth, supposed to replicate her real features, but terrible in its inadequacy. Neighbors saw him through his window dancing with the figure of a woman. He was brought to trial but never sentenced and Maria Elena's body, such as it was, still dolled up with his horrifying artifice and inadequate mummification was put on show in a funeral home where thousands of curious members of the public would go to view the spectacle. The first time I heard the story, I was angry. To demand ownership of a woman who doesn't love you, even when she is dead. To take that dead body and make it yours through hideous force, hideous care, hideous attention. It seemed to sum up all the ways in which men could take you without your permission and turn you into something you had never been, which had nothing to do with you. Now, as I read it again through my bewildered grief, I wondered if I was any better than him. I wondered if I ever had been. Perhaps I had just never loved someone madly until now. Perhaps I had always been as violent as a man. Wouldn't I do anything to reverse my loss, the absence of him? Wouldn't I sacrifice not just myself, but himself to get it? Wouldn't I make him everything he wasn't? Make him soft and tender and domesticated and weak, so long as it meant I could convince him to be mine again? I read a case study of a woman Patient M, who suffered from erotomania in upstate New York in the 1970s. The woman was the child of first-generation Chinese immigrant parents and a diligent student at a Christian college. She had a strict but normal upbringing, supportive parents, friends, a handful of supervised dates with boys. In her sophomore year of college, she began to take tutorials from, from a man, Professor X, in his early 40s. The man was a professor of theology, married with two children all involved in the local church and community of which Patient M was also a part. Patient M began sending letters of a personal nature to, to Professor X, telling him about her difficulties with schooling, her family and other relationships. At first he replied, tried to offer her comfort and spiritual guidance, but quickly her correspondence increased, up to 10 letters a day, and he began to be alarmed by their overly familiar tone and strange references to affection and a shared bond that he had no part in. 
though her family, her college authorities, and eventually the police would warn her to leave Professor X alone, Patient M continued and increased her, her campaign, perceiving their attempts to be proof of her theory that the professor's wife was determined to keep them apart. She began to stalk him at his office and his home until she was expelled permanently. Her letters continued to show that she believed Professor X loved her and was kept from her, own, kept from her only by the constraints of their Christian culture. One July morning, professional acquaintances and friends of the professor were shocked to receive a wedding invitation, the marriage of him and patient M. The more distant of them presumed that he had been divorced and was planning a shotgun wedding before he got hold of them and explained the strange situation. It was at this point that patient M was taken into institutional custody, after which her fate is unknown. Several weeks after her detainment, her parents received a phone call from a local Chinese restaurant wondering where the wedding party was, for she had booked a sit-down meal for 30 to celebrate their union. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for reading that part specifically. <laughs> it's one of my favourite bits. Um, Susanna, would you like to go next? Yeah. Um, I'll do a wee intro. So, Susanna Dickey is the author of Tennis Lessons and Common Decency. Her poetry has been published in the TLS, Poetry London and Poetry Ireland Review. In 2019, she won the Vincent Buckley Poetry Prize and in 2021 was longlisted for the Sunday Times Short Story Award. Um, she's also an Eric Gregory Award winner, a prize granted for a collection of, uh, by a poet under the age of 30 and her debut collection will be published next year. Um, so, Common Decency is uh, about two women living in the same um, apartment block in Belfast, um, one floor up from one another, down from one another, um, Lily and Siobhan, um, both of whom are kind of experiencing self-atrophy in different ways. Lily is grieving her mother who has died recently from pancreatic cancer and she has very much retreated into herself in response to this grief. Um, Siobhan is experiencing a sort of preemptive grief um, because she's in a doomed relationship with a married man um, and she's sort of retreating into the memories of the initial stages of their courtship because she sees him so infrequently. Um, so both of them are kind of regressing in this way, like very much focused on the past rather than their present and are sort of spiralling into increasingly self-destructive behaviour. Um, so I'm going to read a bit um, uh, where Siobhan is reminiscing on um, meeting Andrew, who is the married man. With every muscle in her body, she willed him towards her. And when she saw his feet next to her chair, she felt telekinetic, as though her lust was sanctioned by unseen forces. He said, how is it? And she said, I don't know, I can't read. And he laughed. She turned the book over and was surprised to see that it was Daisy Miller. He said, I really love the portrait of a lady. And she, grasping in the chambers of her memory for any information, said, it's good, but my favorite is the turning of the shrew. He <laughs> laughed again. He has an easy laugh, which he theorizes comes partly from his innate need to please people, but also from a genuine pleasure he takes in living, given the chance. He said, would you like to have a drink with me? And she said, yes. And they decamped to another archipelago of chairs in an empty lounge. They spent the next two and a half hours cross-legged on a sofa, facing one another. He seemed young to her, but not in the way she now knows her students to seem young, brash so as not to betray their ignorance. He seemed young like conversation wasn't about using the other person's contribution as stepping stones to his own, young like it didn't matter to him whether he spoke at all. He told her about his wife and daughter on the first night, and later she was irritated with herself for being shocked, given his wedding ring, given the disproportionate gratitude he showed her, which could only have come from a man who hadn't felt wanted in a long time. They held hands for three uninterrupted minutes on the second night, while he told her that he'd never leave his family, that he couldn't. They kissed on the third, close-mouthed and chaste, his mouth seasoned with chip vinegar. When he checked out on the final morning, he left a note for her at reception with his email address rather than his phone number, as though that might absolve them. They exchanged emails every day for a month. A fortnight in, she wrote that she loved him. A fortnight later, he wrote it back. A month later, he asked if they could meet. 
The day before they saw one another, she spent the afternoon on Royal Avenue trying on skirts and blouses. That morning, she curled her hair and put on layers and layers of mascara till her lashes were huge and rigid. When she saw him walk through the station doors from the platform onto the concourse, she felt pangs of regret at all the ways she could have looked better. He took four equine bounds towards her and then her face was pressed to his neck. Afterwards, he would reminisce about how it felt to hold her and hear her breath catch in her throat. A lot of their moments together are like this. They feel scripted in their enormity. He struggled to achieve orgasm with a condom on. They make them so restrictive, he'd said, plaintively contemplating his strictured penis. So after she'd accompanied him to the station, she went to the walk-in clinic and acquired three months' worth of combined contraceptive pill. When the doctor asked if she wanted some free, free prophylactics, she replied, no thank you, with the smugness of someone who has captured monogamy. <laughs> Something about him made her different, recalibrated her emotional vocabulary. She was suddenly tender and saccharine, prone to lengthy pontificating about her feelings. If he devoted a paragraph to telling her how meeting her had changed his life, she devoted two. It became an emotional one-upmanship. Who could feel more and express it better? Which led to an agonizing sense of exposure when she was the more superlative. Soon, it stopped being a conscious decision and she was the person she'd been emulating. She had become his emotional protege. After a couple of days spent together, she'd returned to her dark, sticky bedroom the atmosphere like sorbet and the surfaces piled with disheveled coursework, and she'd weep. She'd weep for the injustice thrust upon her, for the pain of wanting him, of being denied him. They still talk often about how they met. They discuss it at length, the immediate attraction, the initial resistance to the immediate attraction, the ultimate futility of such resistance. She talks about how beautiful she looked, even in her hotel uniform with her hair pulled back. She says, no, there's no way because she knows her small featured egg-shaped face is one that benefits from some hair around it. Yes, he insists, and then he says that it wasn't just how she looked, that from the first conversation he felt understood in a way that he never had, that she delighted him, that she was inimitable and clever and witty, that she made him feel young, that she made him feel wanted. She reciprocates. She tells him that he's the most handsome man she's ever seen, that she's never wanted anyone the way she wanted him. Through repeated framings of their history, they solidify their love as mythic, canonical, almost preordained. This belies the more sordid elements of their pairing and casts them as beyond logic, beyond pedestrian questions of morality. She thinks they both mean it when they say that they are the loves of each other's lives, or at least they think they mean it, which she supposes is the same thing. A couple of months in, she came to understand the negatives of being the extraneous attachment to an intact couple. She was on her first placement in a school that elicited the same unsavoury response from everyone it was mentioned to. A response fueled by some composite of cultural tribalism, stereotyping of location, and sufficient anecdotal material to affirm those stereotypes. That said, the school did lack resources and things were difficult. One Friday afternoon during a film screening, one child had a seizure. Siobhan quickly learned that 10 and 11 year olds are an unsettling mix of cynical and deranged. <laughs> they know enough about the world to feign an authority, thereby making it apparent how little they know about the world. She arrived home with greasy skin, a throbbing shoulder and a faint smell of urine on her clothes. When she messaged Andrew to ask if she could call him, the response came an hour and a half later. Sweetheart, you know we can't talk on the phone when I'm at home. The following day, they messaged for several hours about his daughter's tantrums and newly acquired fear of zips. And then he had to disappear to cook spaghetti hips and replace the fastenings on her fleece with Velcro. Tara called to ask how the placement was going, but somehow Tara's comfort felt less worthwhile than his would have been. She answered Tara's sensitive, probing questions with non-committal mumblings, said she was too tired to talk. This was something else her relationship with Andrew had done invalidated the attention of the other people in her life. She needed his attention, only his. Thank you. It's funny, because 
I know that you two were looking through readings, you know, just before we went on stage. So I'm aware that you did not plan that. But those <laughs> readings just spoke so beautifully to each other. It's amazing, and I think it really sets up our conversation perfectly because both of these novels, to me, really capture um, obsessive love and obs obsession in a way that I think I think not many others do. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I'm interested to know where that kind of came about as, as a topic that you wanted to focus on for the book for both of you. Um, Megan, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of nice listening to that, reminding me that like I really love Susanna's novel and part of that, like, uh, I feel like we shared that concern with like uh, the attraction of that resistance and like how mm -hmm. exhilarating and sexy and eventually awful that, 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 um, <laughs> that like um, attempts to override resistances. And I think, yeah, so, so I had, um, I wanted to write a relationship from beginning to end was sort of the initial idea that I had for, for, for the novel. Um, because um, I think I, I, was, I, was, I was about 20, 25, 26 when I started to write the novel and I, and I had just become single for the kind of the first time in my life. And, uh, and I was trying to understand that the end of a relationship wasn't the end of the world. And, and, uh, and, and I wanted to, yeah, to, to, to write the finality of a, of a completely dead relationship in a novel in, 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 a, in a way to explain to myself that it was okay for that to have happened in the world. Um, and I was interested in romantic obsession and in that, like, uh, m my life sort of lacked a lot of narrative trajectory after school. I dropped out of college very quickly and didn't really know how to live or what to do with my time or what I was good at, or you know, what the world, how the world, world could find me good. And so romance had kind of become the, the, the narration to my life. And then every time that I had fallen in love, it, it, it became the point of, uh, of, of, of myself and, and how I spent my time. Um, and, and that kind of all encompassing totality that I had uh, I'd ended up in giving my relationships uh, was very devastating and stopped me from kind of having a life for a long time. So um, yeah, I, I was, I was sort of um, trying. I was trying to like correct my own mm -hmm. life by writing this in a way, <laughs> and I and I, I guess I, I wrote a, a heightened, like more, more visceral and more disgusting version of of things that I had experienced to try and like repel myself a little mm -hmm. bit to like make myself not want to be in love anymore. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting that you you mentioned it kind of coming from you know, personal experiences, but at a remove, because reading it and, and, and reading around it, I, I do see, and, and this happens a lot with writing by women, um, people being like, oh, well, this must be just a book about Megan. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, actually, to me, the book very, very consciously is not about you. Like, it feels like there's a distance between the emotions of the unnamed narrator and the person writing the book. Like, there's a space there, and that felt really important to me. Yeah, um, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, there was, um, you know, there was there was a, enough time had passed between the the sort of age of the woman in the book, and then also the extremity of those feelings when I experienced versions of them myself. That yeah, I, I was able to to like create some some like heightened dramatic version of reality. But I do I do honestly think because I know it is true that that women get asked that question a lot. But I think in my case it is only fair because I, I've I've like used all of my biographical details. <laughs> so I think it would be unfair of me to be like. Uh, yeah. to be put out by people asking that or thinking about that. Um, but yeah, definitely part of what was like uh, fun in a way for me about writing the character was was to make it a kind of, um, you know, th theatrical version of of, uh, of myself or a past self of mine and to, mm -hmm. and to like lean into all the things that I hate about myself and to make them really blatant, you know? <laughs> yeah. And how about you, Susanna? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think something I'm really interested in is like, I guess sort of shame as a kind of mm. um, propulsive, like um, kind of affective force. And there's this writing that talks about how shame can arise from like your object cathexis, the thing upon which you're primarily focused being taken away from you and you still having all the feelings towards it, but now nowhere to put it and how those feelings then transmute it into like shame. Yeah. Um, and I think for both my protagonists, that's something that's happening. They've both um, have the kind of person around whom they've centered their emotional lives, either already departed or seemingly in the process of a mm -hmm. slow departure. 
um, and how, you know, and, and so much of the book is about narrative, um, narrativizing, mm -hmm. either narrativizing the lives of other people or how we narrativize our own lives to justify our behavior. And I think there's probably nothing more so than a kind of relationship like this one um, that Siobhan is experiencing with this older married man. Um, like a relationship like that requires narrative Absolutely. to, yeah. to un enable yourself to <coughs> keep going through it because you're not having sufficient experience to justify it. You're seeing him very infrequently. Everything logical is telling you that this is a bad thing to be participating in. So you mm -hmm. fall back on narrative to, to make it make sense to you, to make it make sense within the context of your life. Um, and yeah, so I was, you know, interested in exploring that in kind of mm -hmm. this obsession, shameful, yeah. like, like cathexis way. Um, and yeah, it, it sat as a kind of then, um, sat in opposition to what Lily is doing. Mm -hmm. um, but they're both kind of, um, kind of, opposites to one another but also incredibly similar in that their feelings are the same but about such different losses yeah. um and yeah and i think probably I, I you know um touching on what the second question you just asked megan um i think probably a lot of what was able to fuel my writing of that relationship was a time in my life when you know a lot of bad things coalesced i didn't have very much money I was in an incredibly dysfunctional relationship and I had no sense of purpose. Um, and I used all those things uh, also to justify having no friends or hobbies. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's really great when that happens because five years later you can write about it. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Sounds like you, you have friends and hobbies now though. <laughs> Seems really positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, you two are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, I loved what you said there about how if you're not getting enough of an experience, mm. you have to kind of cling to those things and create a narrative and a journey. And mm. I have to say, while thinking of questions around these book, you know, this interview, um, you, I feel like both of your works are kind of like a to a lot of of you know, female millennial stories of, of the moment or whatever. But actually, I kept thinking of the TV show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. Have you guys seen it? Yeah. yeah. It's like, especially there's a song called Love Kernels, which is like the funniest <laughs> right, yeah, song yeah. ever. And it's just about like, it's like, I will give you the bare minimum mm -hmm. and you will just like drink it up. Yeah. Um, because I also think that for all that these are, are you know, serious books with, with moments of pathos and stuff, I find them incredibly funny at points. Mm. Um, and I was shocked when kind of reviewing notes before the event, some of the reviews were like, no, these are very serious. There's not, someone said that there's no humor in, in your book. And <laughs> I, was, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> so I wondered, yeah, what, what do you guys feel the function of, of, of humor in that is? And was it important to you to include it? I, oh, no, I, I, uh, mm. I, I, I honestly would have, well, no, I was very worried that it was um, completely humorless myself. <laughs> uh, as in, as in, because like um, my my writing, I, I wrote essays for 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 a couple of years before I wrote this book, and uh, they were all quite serious and not not completely lacking in any humor, but but you know they're about very serious things that are very um, painful a lot of the time. But in my actual life, like I. Uh, <laughs> I like to have a laugh. <laughs> as, as in, like, I, honestly, like, I feel like the point of life is, for me, is not writing. It's, like, honestly to have a laugh. And, 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 and like, yeah. that's what I like to spend my time doing. And so it felt increasingly weird to me that all my work was kind of in opposition to that. And so when I was writing Acts of Desperation, um, I finished it and just thought, God, what a fucking bummer. And, like, uh, <laughs> I, w and I, w I was happy to have written it and, I, and I, had, I had to write it, but I was also kind of sad that I was putting another thing into the world that contradicted what I feel like I'm essentially yeah. like in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But then my, my editor suggested, because I wrote a column at the time, that New Statesman column, which was sometimes funny, she was like, can you try and make it a bit funny? I was like, no, honestly, like, it's, it's kind of hard to impose. <laughs> Add a few gags. Exactly, yeah. So, so I, I did, I, w I wished I could have done that, but, but I wasn't able to kind of... Um, 
yeah, I, I couldn't after the fact go and, and add in some like mm. humorous anecdotes or whatever. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I, I do agree that some of it is funny and um, and uh, yeah, with, with a bit of distance now when I read back on it, there are things that I laugh at in it that I didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's also because it's like from the perspective of a very self-important narcissistic young person and like, yeah. and I was a bit younger and probably more narcissistic when I started writing it, I think, and I hope. And uh, so, it, so maybe like even the little bit of distance, because mm. it's now, five years since I wrote a lot of it, almost all of yeah. it actually. So even like that little bit of distance, I think makes me find it funny in a way that probably I didn't Absolutely. at the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Susie, how about you? Well, I mean, there's also that great scene where Kieran trips over a bucket and splits his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you see his heart-shaped underpants yeah. billowing in the wind. Many banana peels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, also, I too also enjoy kicking back with a beer and a joke. <laughs> 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 You've heard it here first. Um, Women writers actually like their laugh. I think it's um, great. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, because we are both writing um, these quite um, narcissistic, um, solipsistic people. Mm -hmm. And I think that really is very funny, you know, to an <laughs> external perceiver. Mm, there is yeah. nothing funnier than a person who is just so devoted to their own self seriousness. And so the humor kind of just arises, I think, organically from that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, like these are, you know, we're writing people existing within the world. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find a good, you know, realist novel dealing with some of the most miserable of subjects that doesn't at times find humor because yeah. people are fundamentally predisposed to finding humor mm -hmm. as a sort of relief from that misery. And I think to try and obliterate that from a novel would be to miss out on some fundamental aspect of how we cope, of how we like respond to trauma, to yeah. um, grief, to, you know, to heartbreak. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'd set out um, to you know, try to include humor in it. But mm. I just think by nature of what you're writing. Um, also, I'm just a really funny gal. <laughs> um. I'm trying to think now, like, can I think of any, like, contemporary novel dealing with similar things that is completely humorless, mm. that is, like, absolutely <laughs> bofist? Yeah, I'm not sure. sure. Gwendolyn Riley yes. is, 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 oh my is God. miserable. <laughs> oh. But those novels are still so, so yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, you're right, yeah. Although I find them, probably they're like the, the extreme end of the spectrum. Like I probably, <laughs> I have to read them in tiny little chunks. Mm, yeah. It's just too grim. <laughs> um, some of the, the parts that I find the funniest uh, in both books actually are, are kind of about, about like the artifice of being a human woman. Mm -hmm. And like those moments where um, both the unnamed protagonist and um, Siobhan um, prepare themselves for a man. And it just, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot recently about, about, about ageing. <laughs> um, and the fact that now we have this kind of other generation, Gen Z, uh, who are in adulthood and who, uh, I feel like they've just, they haven't come up through the same absolutely like batshit world of early 2000s feminism, mm. which really taught you that like, you, this is, this is the utmost value in yeah. life is just to spend all of your time on the creation of this kind of mask of femininity um but there's an absurdity to that and, mm. and and that i felt was captured really great in both in both novels and i don't know, i don't even know if you i feel i feel like i know you're a millennial but i don't know if you're a millennial <laughs> um, i'm actually 14. you're 14. Yeah. oh jeez yeah. congratulations i look i look terrible a wonder kid <laughs> um but yeah they, they both to me seem to capture someone who was kind of created by those structures would you agree Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there, there was someone in Waterford where I'm from, when I went back, uh, the first time I was able to go back after COVID, um, my book came out in March of 2021, so I, hadn't really, I wasn't able to like, do anything when it came out, and then the first time I went back to Waterford, this woman that I know who's, uh, yeah, who's maybe like 21 or 22, 
She's like, yeah, I really like the book, but like, what, 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 why is she like that? <laughs> and like, why, why does she care what that guy like, thinks? So ah, you grew up with like healthy like, relationships and therapy, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I was like, that's really nice that she actually can't empathise with the it's character fantastic. at all. You yeah. know, like she, she actually is quite confused. She was confused as to why she wouldn't just be like, all right, then if you don't want to go out with me, fuck off or whatever. You know, and like, <laughs> she, she just, she just couldn't really in any way understand what I was getting at with the character, which I found yeah. kind of great. You know, that's lovely. Um, but yeah, then also. I don't know, it's an interesting one because um, I, I don't know, I think there's also a little bit of Gen Z like reactive backlash to feminism though at the same time. Like yeah. recently I was in New York and there was this, there's this whole sort of subset of uh, kind of like downtown reactionary cool people who mm -hmm. are reacting against like, uh, e even though it was kind of a nightmare for us growing up in many ways and like women's magazines were still really insane and like telling you to lose weight and be pretty mm -hmm. or whatever but also it was like very much understood in my childhood and in my home that like feminism was good and yeah you know <laughs> equality was something we should <coughs> strive for and mm -hmm. you know I, I feel like even when it wasn't enacted that was still like a, a given and then yeah I don't know I do talk to some people women younger than me now who find I guess like that that they find it to be like a little bit scolding or whatever and so react against that and yeah. and, and go like you know what actually no I'm going to be a a, a, a traditional wife and that's like my mm -hmm. yeah. my uh reaction to all to all of the what they perceive to be like a little bit um prescriptive you so know interesting yeah yeah because also I feel like like the period the early 2000s period to me was very much that post-feminism like oh we have it all we don't need it like yeah fine and then you had the post-post feminism where we were like no actually yeah yeah this isn't okay and now we're in the post yeah. post post <laughs> yeah. or maybe sure like maybe maybe, maybe like 23 year olds are just stupid and, and they there is a tipping stupid. point there's a <laughs> you hit i think especially uh sorry we've gone off topic and we yeah back sorry to this, i promise <laughs> but i do feel like there's a tipping point at like age 24 25 where you've grown up and even socialized as a woman, and everyone's like, feminism is important. You have rights. You can do whatever you like. And then you go into the world, and you're like, yeah, oh, this is bullshit. Yeah, yeah. None of this is true. <laughs> and then you're like, fine. Yeah. We're doing feminism now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe they just haven't hit that tipping point yet. <laughs> <laughs> to carry on. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I also feel like the kind of um, very sort of conservatively minded will never cease to find kind of new heights of kind of conservatism in response to like the most incremental of steps forward in terms of progressiveness mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah it's like oh um you know uh potentially we're narrowing the wage gap mm -hmm. the very very natural response to that is to you know summon up this cabal of young men who now want to murder everyone yeah you know <laughs> it's like it's it's incredible how kind of reactionary, conservatively minded people can be and mm -hmm. um, sort of progressive changes that really will have no practical impact on their lives can um, kind of elicit such ire, such fury yeah. that the reaction is to go like full scale mm. violent and, and like just and it's 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 remarkable, and you know I do think like this weird trend now there seems to be for like the, the stay at home girlfriend thing, mm -hmm. yeah, and and you know that's the kind of uh, female response, and then you've got the kind of Andrew Tate thing happening with wow. young men. Is that his name, Andrew Tate? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, the bald, awful man. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, who, who works out all the time and definitely hasn't been laid <laughs> ever. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, those are who grow out of just the most like minor of achievements mm -hmm. for li like liberal thinking and it's, it's, it's insane. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, you know, to come back to like this idea of kind of um, primping, of, mm -hmm. you know, because I've got these two characters in Common Decency who are very, very different in, in that Siobhan is obviously focused on her like ablutions in service of being loved because she's desperate to have romantic love and Lily that's not her concern at all but you see in the book that in her kind of adolescent years she developed this sort of body dysmorphic thinking that her mum was always like a temperance to her mum would like say you know 
nobody's looking at you, nobody's looking at you, mm. you, are, you are normal, you are not a monster. And then kind of now in her absence, those thoughts are being permitted to run rampant. And mm. that's not even kind of in service to a typical trying to win a man thing. That is just by virtue of being a product of her environment. Those thoughts kind of implant themselves and then manifest in this sort of self mutation. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and yeah, I wanted to explore kind of how self hatred or like, um, yeah, being so um, focused upon your physical form isn't always necessarily just in response to a romantic ideal. It can mm -hmm. just be by being a product of your environment Absolutely. as a person. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, thank you. So we will be taking questions from the audience and probably come to you just next. But before we move on, I would like to touch on language and also Irishness, given the context. Um, and now both of you are, are within the diaspora now, right? Because you also live in London, Susie. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about, about how you feel your language kind of sits within the greater tradition of Irish language, uh, Irish language writing, as in Hiberno-English writing, <laughs> not in the Irish language. Um, do you feel like that's influenced your writing style? Does it come through? Or do you feel like, you, like your novels kind of sit in that, uh, like, I don't know, empty space in the middle of the Atlantic, <laughs> where like mid-Atlantic cool novels live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I th I th increasingly, uh, well, increasingly, I've only written one other novel apart from this, but um, mm -hmm. in, in my second novel, it, it felt like I really wanted to s speak in, a, in, a, in an Irish way. And, or, or, mm -hmm. or, or it, basically, there's, a, there's like a kind of way of speaking in Waterford that I wanted to capture. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I think in, in my debut, I, I didn't really do that. Uh, I think I think I was still like kind of living in the internet when I wrote mm -hmm. this book, and I yeah. didn't really know where in the world I actually was going to settle and where I would spend most of my time. I'd, I'd only just moved out of Ireland, really, but I wasn't sure if I would stay in England, and I, I just felt a bit like I didn't have a real nation, and I was yeah. I was like traveling a lot, not in a fun way, but because I had no money, and so I would just like go and like cats it for people or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just felt very unmoored, and and I feel like my brain was very online at the time, mm -hmm. in the way that I, I think it's a little bit less now. Um, so yes, to answer your question, I think the first novel is doesn't feel like especially Irish to me. I, yeah. I think the story could have taken place in any number of of settings. And the reason that it's specifically in Ireland is only because I didn't feel the authority to like go, well, she lives in Brussels or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like I, it was because I didn't know any other places to set it, but it didn't, like Ar Ireland isn't like key to the story, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. And then in this new novel, yeah, I just, I just w felt like interested in wanting to like capture some of the rhythms of the way that my family speak and, uh, and because I miss Waterford and I, I really love Waterford. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just kind of wanted to, like pay a bit of tribute to it in a way, and like, and and I liked the idea of people there having this novel to read that is set there. Also, well, some of it is set there. Um, so yeah, I think it is important to me, but it hasn't always been, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it will continue to be. But but I think it was it was like very yeah very important for me to to do it at least in one book to try yeah. and to capture mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I think that's it's interesting that you're talking about like kind of citing the novel within Waterford and within Waterford's like linguistic idiosyncrasies because that like there's kind of that zooming in, in in Ireland that like every every small town every every county every region has its own linguistic idiosyncrasies and um, that do fit within the whole of yeah. Hiberno English but actually are, are so specific to themselves and I have no idea what those are for Waterford yeah I look forward to discovering them <laughs> and then Susie you're originally from Derry but the book mm -hmm. is set in Belfast and, and so perhaps that speaks to you as well yeah um and I think something I'm coming because I think it um, initially I would have uh, thought about it ex explicit, like um, entirely in terms of language. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I've noticed, uh, especially with poetry. Because um, I wrote this long poem a couple of years ago that was in Hendiga syllables, which is where every line has eleven syllables. And um, I was living in London at the time and was showing it to kind of English friends and mm -hmm. had an English editor on it. Um, and I realised that words to which I gave 
two syllables <laughs> were words to which they gave one. And oh, they would say, that. oh, you know, this line doesn't yeah. have 11 <laughs> syllables, it has more. And I was like, well, it doesn't my voice, <laughs> and it's my poem. <laughs> so, no, I'm not going to cow tie to your kind of kissing <laughs> point. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not going to cow tie. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, you know, um, I'm going to remain faithful to the way I say mm -hmm. words. I'm not, you know, and poetry, I guess, canonically has... Um, in the UK, you know, is so dominated by the kind of men of English letters um, who would be saying these words different from, differently from Absolutely. me. And I was like, well, no, I'm going to kind of think about how I say the words and I'm going to yeah. um, use syllabics accordingly. Um, but even in terms of form, I'm starting to think about it because um, I've been reading this book at the minute called Enduring Time um, mm -hmm. by Lisa Baretzer. And um, she opens it with um, a quote by Denise Riley that is um, about the death of her son. And she talks about how after a sudden unexpected grievance, time pulls, it becomes a circle without a rim. And this book is all about how um, kind of the modern ideology of time, this idea of temporality was kind of born in the 16th century with the idea mm -hmm. of wage labor and production. Yeah. And this was where time became reduced to this linear concept rather than mm -hmm. something that is flexible and can be altered. Um, and as the kind of colonial project went on, this linear idea of industrial based time was imposed on more and more kind mm -hmm. of places and peoples. And um, the people from nations that were colonized were relegated to kind of antiquity because they didn't initially subscribe to this yeah. capitalist idea of time. And yeah, there's this idea that like linearity and um, kind of um, like set progress based time is, uh, is, you know, is the norm and it, and it shouldn't be because time mm -hmm. is entirely constructive and subjective. Um, but yeah, so yeah, this idea that I've been thinking about it in terms of the, the novel, the arc of the novel. Mm. Um, and because this novel is also about grief, I wanted to kind of challenge that idea of, of time as a, yeah. as a smooth arc mm. and try to capture that time pooling thing because I think also by nature of being Irish, um, you know, because I'm from the north and people in the north, there's a very split, I guess, perception of the north of Ireland as being um, a colonial project. Mm. Um, and, and so it was interesting to think about it in those terms, but I do think yeah, and you know, how I want to start approaching the novel is to not subscribe to this, like, you know, time as a fixed thing that we understand in module, modules, yeah, like yeah. not a modular entity, something that is flexible and subjective to grief and can be altered and changed. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's bound up for me also with Irishness. For sure. That that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to read that book. Um, okay, I think we have time for a few quick questions. We do have roving microphones. Um, so what you'll do is if you put your hand up, then I will call upon you. Um, so let's see, we actually have one up at the back here. Could we start with this person up here? We've got lots, so we'll see if we can get around to everyone, but we might not be able to. Hello. Hello, thanks very much. Um, just picking up on your last point there, Susanna, do you think time heals... Um, if so time is not if time is not linear or mm. may not be linear, yeah, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> see, because I I think there's this idea that you know recovery from grief from trauma will just happen as a consequence of time's passing, and I don't think that's true. You know, in the same way, time isn't necessarily always going towards progress. You know, we're finding this right now in terms of the climate crisis, which is mm. happening as a consequence of this very um, progress focused idea of time you know production time will lead to something better we need to produce in this time to make the future and the result of that thinking is that you know our future is now in jeopardy um and so i don't think time necessarily is a salve is a bam it all you know what will come down the road is entirely um dependent upon the actions you take in the immediate moment um, which I think is why in this novel, you know, you have this woman grieving her mother, but she's not, she's dwelling within it. She's focusing entirely on her memories. She's not taking any active steps to heal herself. And so time's not going to do it for her. So as a consequence, time doesn't get to pass in that way. Um, how we interact with time is entirely, you know, of our own choosing. So 
No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, who? What other questions do we have? We have a lot of hands. Can we get this person on the left here? Thank you very much. Um, just here. Thank you. And please keep your hands up, just so that we can maybe uh, like for the next questions. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you, Susanna. It's really fascinating to hear you talk about, um, you know, men of English letters in the world of poetry mm. and obviously a kind of tradition that you must, you know, inherently feel you're writing against. And I just mm. thought that two of you, um, you know, you're, um, I think you kind of said both Gen Z, millennial, post-feminist novel, no Irish novelists. And it seems to me that's a kind of category that the market has found mm -hmm. and is promoting quite vigorously, and I just wondered if you had any comments on what that feels like, um, particularly maybe thinking a bit about the kind of Irish tradition and, you know, a kind of post-field day, post-Celtic tiger sort of um, mm. denouement. <laughs> I'll uh, go, shall I? Yeah, <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> oh, um, no, you're, yeah, it, it did feel a little very strange to me to have the n novel, I mean, of course, it has to be categorised, but it did feel strange for it to be uh, marketed in, in a certain way. And, and it felt ultimately quite frightening for me to feel that my career was dependent on a moment in publishing. Mm. And so I've definitely reacted against that with the next one and completely... <laughs> like I've, ju I've just set this novel in the 70s in Ireland, basically, and it's a family drama, and it's completely non-fashionable and, like, traditional, really. And, uh, and I think that was informed by my discomfort at being marketed. At, to, to do with m myself. Uh, and and, and it's, again, it's very understandable because it's a quite uh, biogra autobiographical novel, but yeah, I, I didn't um, feel comfortable with, with m m my body being the way that it was, that it was uh, positioned in literature. So yeah, I think I've definitely reacted against that now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, because I mean, you know, if I'm uh, being honest, I'm very aware of the fact that I got picked up for publication because of Sally Rooney, I was part of like a sudden kind of upsurge, uptaking of young female Irish novelists because everyone was hoping to recreate that. And I reacted against that by very bravely writing a novel that very few people read and <laughs> <laughs> even fewer people liked. <laughs> but um, I do think, yeah, I'm in the next one that I'm working on, I, you know, I'm doing something similar in that I'm trying to write something that is so unlike anything that could, because you know, critical culture, unfortunately, now and marketing is, it's very reliant upon comparison. And so I am now trying to write something that is incomparable to anything that might be popular. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. What is it about? Um, you say you need more? Uh, well, it's working title is Sex Horse. <laughs> 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 Please keep that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. That's brilliant. And I feel like that's also all we need to know. Right? You just set it up perfectly. Um, someone already has a microphone in the second row. Pardon me. Yeah, it's sort of a question following on from the last one. Because as a kind of a, an older feminist, I haven't read your, bo your books and I'd really like to. And I think I probably prefer your second books to the ones, <laughs> the ones you're just writing now. Because I just felt... I didn't get Sally Rooney. It's like, oh my God, mm. these young people today, super privileged, super educated, you know, actually not poor either. You know, I mean, honestly, what a waste of a life. They were living, <laughs> you know, like just obsessing about, you know, married men and mm. trying to steal them from other, from other. I mean, like, oh, the narcissism of it really freaked me out, really turned me off. And I just did not, okay, the films were different. <laughs> <laughs> Normal people was a bit different because they were much younger, so mm. I kind of forgave them. But like, <laughs> you know, it's like you're writing these books about aspects, obviously, of your younger selves, and you're describing looking back and thinking, oh, I've kind of got over that now. Like, you know, I'm really different now. I've, I've lived through that, you know, and I, I know better. Mm. And, you know, you talked about your friend who didn't have any empathy at all, and you were surprised. I mean, you know what? And I just wonder what your own attitude is to the characters in your book. I mean, do you still kind of like, are you still with them? 
Are you asking us to feel sympathy or just go, oh my God, grow up, girl? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think that's up to you, isn't it? As in, mm. as in I, I don't have a feeling in, in my head about what, how you should take the character. I, like the, People have very divergent feelings about her and, and if you hate her and you kind of find that fun to read then mm. that's great but it, you know if, if you feel some sympathy for her then that's also fine I I, I, I don't uh, I don't like her but I but I have sympathy for kind of any person and uh, I yeah I don't I don't feel like scathing towards her I think I think being narcissistic and young is that is not new and, I, and it's not just us <laughs> like like I, I think it has different expressions now but I, but I don't really believe that that I don't know that that people in the past weren't also self-obsessed when they were young younger um and I can understand that like that I, th I think that m maybe like the constant need to self-describe that the internet encourages it makes it worse and makes it more apparent to other people but but ultimately, I think yeah, being being a narcissist is is not specific to to a generation. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't. You know, the novels I love rarely um, have um, at their centre characters I like. Um, you know, I think a, a well written, awful person is brilliant. Um, and I think yeah, I mean, I I you know, I have written two incredibly self destructive people in this book. Um, neither of whom I like, you know, big thumbs up to their actions. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm hoping to kind of write their self-destructive tendencies in a way that doesn't maybe necessarily make sense to someone outside of that experience, but you can see the internal logic of their thinking as to mm. why they're behaving in this way. Um, and, you know, I think uh, you, it's, you know, there are different ways of approaching it. Um, I think... It's interesting to kind of look at, um, which I think we're both trying to do, kind of that narcissism within like the wider kind of um, economic milieu, you know, like how like self-destructiveness within a kind of precarious housing environment, precarious um, environmental environment, <laughs> um, a kind of, um, yeah, how, um, how all these things kind of come together to make a person even worse, you know, mm -hmm. how, um, and I think that is what kind of might make, you know, these novels different from a novel written about a narcissistic self-destructive person 50 years ago, is that um, it's how all these different disparate um, socioeconomic factors feed in to that solipsism, that self-destruction. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they suck. <laughs> the people I wrote, they suck. Um. I, I think you're totally bang on, though, and like, when reading um, Common Dangerously, what struck me is that the, the self-obsession and the kind of the narcissism in the book was not... Because, as well, I would say some very, like, lazy reviewing of both books would be like, no, you know, these people are this way because of the patriarchy, and you're mm. like, actually, they're this way because of, like, late-stage surveillance capitalism mm. and the internet and the patriarchy. It's, it's <laughs> a very specific context. And the other thing is, you did a beautiful uh, interview in The Independent earlier in the year mm. where someone was like, oh, you know, these messy millennial women, weren't we done with those? And, and you very rightly hit back and were like, well, we've been reading books about messy millennial terrible men for like <laughs> a thousand years. Mm. So, you know, there's space for many different explorations of that identity. Mm. Right, small rant. Um, there's somebody with a microphone here. Oh, we're out of oh. time. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm really sorry about that, lads. Um, but we will be selling books in the British Library after this, and Megan and Susie will be signing. Um, thank you so much for your attention, for your care, for your answers, and for your lovely questions. Thank you thank for joining you. us thank today. You. Thank you.